Welcome back, Whistle Watchers. Well, what an exciting weekend of rugby. Now, let's get straight into it. Wasn't that a big weekend of sport? And what a comeback. Kansas City Chiefs against San Francisco 49ers. Oh, hang on. That's the wrong Whistle Watch. <laughs> uh, let's get into our Six Nations Whistle Watch. Now then, every week we've been focusing on areas of the game that the referees really need to be on top of. Last week we discussed space. This week we're discussing speed, speed of the ball. It's vital that teams get quick ball from the breakdown in particular in order to attack because if you have slow ball, defence is organised. So the two key things here that the referees will be strong on and will want the players to buy into is the tackler moving away so he doesn't linger about slowing the ball down and also the jackler coming in on his feet in the right direction and legal as well, not coming in there and slowing the ball down. So the speed is vital for the continuity of the game. So there's another area of the game for you to keep an eye out on the referees setting the standards early on in the game. Right, let's have a look at the talking points now then. France and Scotland up in Murrayfield. Oh, what an exciting finish. But first of all, what about the yellow card to uh, Uni Antonio? Right, so this actually lands up in the bunker. Now, when they look at it, um, there is an illegal shoulder charge, um, but there is no contact with the head. So therefore, there is no upgrade to a red card. Now, just remember, even if there was no contact with the head, but they felt that the shoulder action was dangerous to warrant a red card, that still could have happened. But correctly so here, it isn't of the high degree of danger to warrant a red card, and quite rightly so, by the bunker, remains at a yellow card. Just remember as well, in that instance, there had been two offsides against Scotland as well. So there were two or three penalties, including this foul play in the build-up, which also may well have contributed to the thoughts of the referee on a yellow card as well. Let's go to the end of the game, which is uh, what everybody's been talking about on that final try. Was it a try, yes or no, on the Scotland TMO try review? Right, what's important to remember here, we have a non-field decision by the referee. So, if the referee has a gut feeling or believes he's, he's seen what has happened, he'll give his view. So, in this instance, he knows the ball is over the line and he knows that it's held up and therefore the question is, my on-field decision is no try because I believe it to be held up. If he wasn't sure, because uh, he hasn't seen it, then he could have asked is it a try yes or no or if he'd felt I've got a grounding but I just want to make sure nothing else has happened then he could have said my on-field decision is a try so it's important to remember thought contribution by the referee so in this instance the question from the referee to the TMO is on-field decision no try which means the TMO looking at all the available angle he has will need to have evidence clear evidence to show otherwise to overturn that on-field decision. Now just remember, not only this is a difficult decision, it's a high-pressure decision as well, because you know that the outcome of the game is inevitable here. So it's added pressure, it's a big, big decision to make. So you have to be clear to get it right. TMO in this instance felt that he didn't have enough clear evidence to overturn the on-field decision, and therefore it remained on the on-field decision as no try. There's no question to ask is it over the line or not because we know it's over the line because the referee has already inputted that. That's why the TMO is not looking at that because we know it's over the line. Right, let's go to Twickenham, England, Wales. Mm. Right, let's look at the Chesham uh, incident of a yellow card sent to the bunker. So we have the Welsh ball carrier tackled by an English player. So the Welsh ball carrier is now already going down, so that reduces his height. We have Chesham then coming in to make a tackle. The tackle is legal. The initial contact is not on the head. The initial contact is around the chest area and then goes up. So in this instance here, what we have to rule at is there foul play. Was there foul play action by Chesham? Well, no, there wasn't. His actions are completely legal. And obviously the ball carrier going down and being low as well contributed to that. So what we have here is a rugby collision and no foul play. So should have been play on. Right then, now this has got you uh, all talking, including George Ford himself. Now then, we have to look here at exactly what happens. What can you do? Well, once you set yourself up to take a conversion, remember penalty is totally different. You can't charge a penalty. It's a conversion. So you're entitled to charge as long as you're behind the line. And once the player, after he set himself up, once he then makes a move, which initiates to you, that he's going to start his run-up, 
as long as you're behind the line, you are allowed to charge. Remember back to the Rugby World Cup with Cheson Colby as well in the South Africa, a game against France in the quarterfinal, very similar as well. So on this instance here, Ford has set himself up. He's static, and then his next movement now means, he's, whether it goes backwards or forwards, his next movement means he's now ready to take the run-up, which is a trigger for the Welsh team to charge down. So on this instance, good awareness by the referee, knowing exactly what was going on, keeping an eye on everything, and correctly so, allows the legal charge down. Still in the England-Wales game, Ethan Brooks uh, causing a penalty try and a yellow card. Was it correct? Well, let's have a look what happens. So we have a mall. We have the Welsh mall going towards the goal line with momentum. We then have footage of Ethan Roots showing us that he then illegally takes that mall down. If it wasn't for that illegal action by Ethan Roots in illegally collapsing that mall, would Wales have probably scored the try? That's the key for you to remember here. Probable, not definite, not 100%, but probable. And the answer is yes, the Wales would probably have scored if it wasn't for the illegal actions of Ethan Roots bringing that mall down illegally early before the goal line. That's it, uh, quite a lot to cover there on Whistle Watch this week. Now it's time for your MLS fans questions. CH Maiden at Nigel Ref Owens. Question is the contact in the air on Dyer by Ford at the end of the game. Should it have been a penalty? Uh, if it is a penalty, then should a penalty try have been considered? I can't see if there were any cover and Dyer is rapid. Well, you are certainly correct that Dyer is rapid. Now then, very interesting when you are watching this myself, and to be honest, I was expecting a penalty for it. Penalty try? No, I don't think so. I think you're pushing it there. But this is what you need to decide here. So let's say Dyer jumps in the air. So let's say he jumps in the air and because he jumps in the air momentum, he lands into Ford and there's nothing Ford could have done to avoid that. Then we'd have play on, no foul play because Ford hasn't done anything wrong. He hasn't gone into Dyer in the air. Now, if you think that Ford did enough or didn't do enough to avoid contact with Dyer who was in the air, then you would have a penalty. And I'm tending to think, now you may say, well, you're Welsh naturally going to say so, but I do think that Wales are a bit unluckier. For me, Ford could have done more to avoid contact with Dyer. And for me, it's just a penalty, nothing more. But I certainly do believe that England were lucky there not to have Ford penalised for contact in the air. But was it more than a penalty? Was it a yellow card? No. Was it a penalty try? Certainly no. But yeah, I do believe it was a penalty. At Celtic Wiz, 17. Nigel Ref Owens, was England's final try a forward pass? Ooh, no, even as a Welshman, I think I'd be pushing that. Uh, marginal, maybe, yes. Is it clear and obviously forward? No, I don't think it is. And in that instance, if it's not clear and obvious, then the referees will tend to let it play. At Safa Matt. Dear Nigel, can you tell me why it's a caterpillar ruck? The nine is allowed to advance past the hindmost foot to roll the ball back before clearing the pass. Surely nine's offside. Also, if the ball is outside the leg of the player, the ball is out. Now then, let's answer the easy bit first. Yeah, if the ball is outside, so the last leg of the player is not covering the ball. So imagine the ball is under my leg here, my leg is over it, the ball is still in. If the ball is on the outside of the body or the leg, then yes, the ball is out, which means anybody who is onside can come around and play the ball. Now, what we tend to do, we allow the nine, the attacking nine, so the nine who has the ball, whose team has the ball, same as a scrum, we allow him to have one foot in front of the ball and one foot behind in order to get that pass away or bring the ball back. Now, if he is two feet in front of the ball, then yes, you're quite right, he's offside, but one feet in front of the ball is fine. So, as long as he has one foot in front and one foot behind, and he uses his feet to get the ball back, then that is okay. But a very, very good question. And that's it for your Emirates fans' questions this week. Thank you for sending them in, and keep sending them in, and I'll try to answer as many as I can. And that's it for Whistle Watch. We've got a little week off now, but we'll be back at the end of February after the next round of the Six Nations. See you then. Bye-bye.